to just introduce everyone so that we know who's in the room. And then our executive director, Larry Sly, is going to give a little bit of background on the food bank um, and the services and programs we provide now. Um, our Oh, Jim is also going to give a little safety introduction. Do you want to go ahead and do that now before we go through the rest of the agenda so you can head out? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Food Bank. My name is Jim Morris. I'm the manager for logistics, facilities, and safety here at the Food Bank. And just quickly, four items of basic safety briefing. One, we're in earthquake country, obviously. Like anywhere else, if you happen to have an incident, stay away from the glass, under the tables. And if you happen to be in the warehouse, stay away from the racks. Following Loma Prieta, the racks held but there were 27 pound boxes of canned fruits and vegetables in various other locations. I don't know why they want to do that. Two, shelter in place. If we were to receive a shelter in place order, possibly from the refinery or conceivably from the highway or the main line of the Union Pacific Railroad, upstairs is our shelter in place area. We can seal it off without the necessary supplies. In case of fire, you go out the front the way you came in. You can go out the emergency exit on your right or left, depending on which way you're sitting. If you happen to be in the warehouse, there's three emergency exits on the back wall. You can also go out the main freight door. All we ask is that if something needs to occur, we'll muster over there and help us account for everyone. If you're sitting some, next to someone that you've never met before, but please tell us if you don't see that individual in that group of people. <laughs> and last, not least, knock on wood, because we're never going to need them. But if we do, on the wall to the, left of the EA's desk, and on the wall on the walkway out of the warehouse, there's an AED. Thank you. Thank you, Barring that disaster, um, <laughs> the way that the morning will hopefully run is um, that we'll hear a little bit about the food bank's history, uh, current programs and services from our executive director, Larry Sly. Then we'll hear a little bit about um, data and statistics on hunger and poverty in the district from our communications director, Lisa Sherrill. And then we'll hear um, from Lisa Lopez um, about her experience accessing food bank services um, and advocating with us. Uh, for policy changes at the state level. Uh, I will run through the advocacy that we've worked on uh, at the state and federal level over the past year, talk about what our priorities are for 2017. And then our programs director, Caitlin Sly, will speak a little bit about the local advocacy that we've done and what we also hope to accomplish um, at the county level. Um, finally, after that, there will be a tour of the warehouse um, that our executive director will lead so that you all can check out the, the pallets that we have and the sorting room and see a little bit of the hands-on operation. Um, okay, great. So before we go around and introduce everyone, um, I just wanted to give a special shout out to Supervisor Anderson. Um, say thank you so much for coming in person. We're really happy to have you here. Um, but also just wanted to go around the room. Um, if you could introduce yourself and in whatever office or organization you're from, uh, just so you can get a sense for who's here this morning. Thanks. Do you want to start? Who me? <laughs> you want me to stand? No. You don't have to stand, but if you'd like, you're okay. welcome to. Uh, I'm Judith Moore, and I'm from the East County, Pittsburgh, Antioch area. And I've been a volunteer signing up people for CalFresh for about three years. And um, I've gone to Sacramento with Carly and Lisa for <laughs> advocacy. And um, I continue this to. Uh, fulfill my life. What else do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's great. laughs> Jeff Rom, I'm with the Food for Thought program in Richmond. We focus on uh, the windows of time when school food programs shut down and the kids are highly vulnerable during those periods. I'm Wendy Neal and I'm from Shell Ridge Community Church. Um, I'm chair of Let's Feed the Kids, which Judy is on our committee, we didn't say that, Judy. <laughs> and we partner with Food for Thought uh, for winter breaks, and then we're also doing um, a project with the Pittsburgh Family Center. I'm Doug Holmes from uh, Shell Ridge Community Church. I live in Danville, and I'm a member of the Multi Faith Action Coalition and the Food Security Capital. Good morning, my 
name is Anna Luzon, District Representative for Supervisor Thompson in Solano County. Good morning, my name is Adrienne Patterson and like Anna Luzon, I as well am also a A2 Supervisor Skip Thompson of District 5 in Solano County. Hi, I'm Simone Yuan Newman. I'm a volunteer board member with the Food Bank and this is my third term. Simone also is the chair of our board's advocacy committee. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Josette Lacey. I'm district representative for Supervisor Erin Hannigan's office. She represents District 1, which is a greater area of Vallejo. Good morning, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Casey Farmer. I am the communications director and senior field representative for State Senator Nancy Skinner, uh, who represents parts of Alameda and Contra Costa County. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Padilla. I'm from Contra Costa County Community Wellness and Prevention Program, and we partner with the Food Bank to do nutrition education. Good morning. My name is Cindy Chin. I'm with Assemblywoman Catherine Baker's office. Good morning, I'm Gail Israel, <coughs> Chief of Staff for Contra Costa County Supervisor, District 2, Candace Anderson, which is the La Marinda area, a little bit of Walnut Creek, and the San Ramon Valley. And I am Candace Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just say thank you to all of you in the room. And I just as I was sitting here reflecting, 35 years ago, as a 21-year-old, getting my undergraduate degree in public policy, my thesis paper was on hunger in America. And as a little 21-year-old, I just thought this is unbelievable that we have people in this country who are literally starving. And so this is something very near and dear to my heart and will continue to be in my leadership role as a county supervisor. Yay. <coughs> Hi, I'm Lisa Lopez. I'm from Contra Costa, and I've been up to Sacramento with Carly uh, advocating and trying to get more help for everybody so we can survive and not have to beg or borrow or God forbid steal. Reed Edwards, uh, also Contra Costa. Um, I am a volunteer advocate working with Coach Carly. Um, also part of a twice a month, hopefully, usually, um, boxing crew here at the food bank. So if you're ever curious about that, um, let me know. <laughs> I'm Neil Zarchin, I'm Grants Administrator here at the Food Bank, and I also work with, with Jeff on Food for Thought and with me. Uh, good morning, my name is Jacob Perez, I'm a board member first year of the Food Bank, and I'm also on the advocacy uh, committee as well, and a board member of the Congress. <coughs> Hi, I'm Aubrey Detmer, um, I'm a field representative for Selena Merchant Morning, I'm Joseph Walter. I'm from Congressman Marcusoni's office and a district representative. I'm in Gray on Mercado. I'm a field representative for Congressman Mike Thompson's office. I work out of the Vallejo office, which covers Vallejo, Sanicia, and then from Sonoma all the way down to Martinez. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Allen, Chief of Staff for Contra Costa Supervisor. Good morning. My name is Bill Bodner. Uh, I used to be on the board here at this food bank. I've been on the board in uh, San Antonio that food bank and I'm a longtime supporter. I'm retired from the oil industry. I used to work right across the street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. My name is Mariana Moore. I'm the director of the Ensuring Opportunity Campaign to End Poverty in Contra Costa. I'm Melody Weintraub and I'm with the Multi-Faith Action Coalition and we work on poverty issues as well. David Gerson, I'm the executive director of Loaves and Fishes of Contra Costa. We serve hot food in the pantry and uh, we serve about 500 people every day. Lillian Roslin, good morning. Uh, Executive Director of the John Muir Matthew Community Health Fund, uh, and a privileged partner uh, with the Food Bank. We were able to help support their efforts to uh, develop and launch the Community Produce Program and their CalFresh Enrollment Expansion Project, and look forward to continuing our support for their efforts. Good morning, Kathleen Adney. I'm the executive director of the Dean and Margaret Lesher Foundation, and I was trying to figure out how long we've been supporting the food bank, and I've been here 22 years, and every one of those years we've been supporting it, so um, we're happy to 
support this wonderful organization have provided support for all kinds of things, including the solar panels, right? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fran Bitterman with First Five Contra Costa, and I staff the Family Economic Support <coughs> Partnership. I'm Donald Sloan, um, the resident of Bay Point, Pittsburgh area, and I'm just here supporting my fiance, Lisa Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Turner, uh, still representative for Senator Bill <coughs> Dodd, a uh, retired police officer from Concord. Spent 27 years in and out of this facility, <coughs> and also a founding member of the uh, Police County Mental Health Disciplinary Team. Did we miss anyone? Sorry. Okay, great. All right. So I'm Larry Sly, I'm the executive director <coughs> of the County Costume Solano. <coughs> Been executive director for over 40 years. Uh, I've worked for the organization pretty well. Um, so, quick update on where we are and, and why I am so grateful that all of you were here. Um, we, we distribute food. Uh, often, what we talk about is we're the wholesaler. We've got the warehouse. David is the retailer, giving food to people in need. We have systems that work incredibly well to get food out to people, and we are constantly trying to make those better. Uh, we distributed over 20 million pounds of food last year, over half of which was fresh fruits and vegetables. So we know we are doing the right thing to help people in the community get the services that they need. But having done this for 40 years, why are there still hungry people in our community? And that's where our board came down. And for those of you who can't see, we <coughs> amended our mission to talk about leading the fight to end hunger in partnership with folks like you. We realize that hunger can be ended in this country, back to your study when you were 21 years old. There is enough food, there are enough financial resources to where people should not be hungry in this community, and yet they are. So while we continue to provide food to people because that's a daily need folks have, we're trying to work with folks here to change the situation so that we could go back to doing what we did when I first started, which is providing short-term supplement to people so they could get through a couple days until they start got a, started to get the food resources that they need from CalFresh or other government support programs. So we really need you here. We appreciate all the elected officials and their aides being here because you are the guys who are gonna make this work. We're in very tentative times right now. It's very interesting the way politics are working and what, what we need to do. And I think that's more why we need to come together and hopefully make a difference in the community. So I'm grateful for all of you being here. Thank you for what you're going to help us do, hopefully to end hunger in our community. Um, and now just for a little bit of background, the bigger picture um, of need in, in Contra Costa and Solano and our communities, we have Lisa Shero. <coughs> all right, well thank you, thank you all for being here. And um, we just wanted to go, like Freddie said, through some background information for you all. Um, starting with Feeding America's Map the Meal Gap study, and about 12% of the population in Contra Costa County and 15% in Solano County are food insecure. And food insecure, uh, based on the USDA measure, means that people do not have access to food at all times for all people in their household. Um, and it, it also means that they're making trade-offs for basic necessities, so they might be choosing to purchase medicine instead of food or paying rent instead of going grocery shopping. Um, more than a third of the people who are food insecure in Contra Costa and Solano counties um, have incomes that are too high to allow them to access programs like CalFresh. CalFresh is what used to be known as food stamps. Um, nationally, it's known as SNAP, and in California, we call it CalFresh. So we will be using those terms interchangeably throughout the presentation, just to let you know. Um, Partially, this is reflective of the high cost of living here in the Bay Area. And in the food banks, uh, in California, our food bank particularly, we are filling that gap for people who um, don't make enough to live in this area, but still make too much to qualify for things like CalFresh. And however, households that do receive CalFresh, about a third also rely on food banks to make it through the month. So food insecurity obviously is linked very closely to poverty, which is still shamefully high despite the overall economic recovery. 10% of the population in Contra Costa and Solano counties 
live below the federal poverty line. What's the trend? What's the trend? I'm sorry. The trend. Been trending up in the last 10 years? So it, since the recession, and probably you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, it has been trending up, but actually, um, and it's even though poverty has been declining in the last couple years, we're still seeing um, higher than pre-recession levels. Um, it's actually 1.4% 1 per, 1 higher in Contra Costa County and 2.5% higher in Solano County. Yes, and although um, the economic recovery has been happening slowly, the feed bank has not seen a significant decline in the people that were serving since the recovery. Our numbers have remained pretty steady. So there's a couple different ways to measure poverty. One is the official poverty measure, which is traditional, uh, traditionally used to determine eligibility for things like CalFresh, but it's widely recognized as being inadequate. And um, so the, there's the supplemental poverty measure, which is a more accurate measure because it takes into account the cost of living um, and non-cash aid like CalFresh. So while poverty, the official poverty rate in California is just under 15%, the uh, supplemental poverty measure calculates that one in five Californians is experiencing economic hardship. And that doubles for seniors in California. Um, and no matter how you look at economic hardship, it is higher for um, racial and ethnic groups, as particularly black and Latino Californians are seeing much higher rates of poverty than their white counterparts. So while the safety net is effective, and we see that through SNAP, um, which is keeping 10.3 million people from falling below the poverty line, it's still not enough. CalFresh has reached about 4.35 million Californians each month in 2015, 2016. <coughs> um, and with other benefits like earned income tax credit, child care tax credit, um, school meals, WIC, and programs like SSI, which are helping reduce poverty, it's still not enough. Even with those programs, one in five Californians continue to live in poverty. And with those assistance programs, food banks are serving one in 10 assistance meals. So the other nine out of 10 are coming from the safety net programs. That's why the food bank sees the importance in advocating for programs like CalFresh. And finally, um, as I mentioned, CalFresh is the first line of defense uh, for people living in poverty in California. And that's again, why it's one of our top advocacy and outreach priorities at the food bank. A third of all CalFresh recipients also rely on food banks to make it through the end of the month. In Contra Costa County, 66,000 individuals receive benefits through CalFresh and 41,000 in Solano County. How does, that, um, how does the number of people that receive benefits correlate to other prisons in Great question. <laughs> in Contra Costa County, um, it's estimated that 51% of the eligible people are receiving CalFresh. In Solano County, it's about 69%, and the statewide average is 66%. So Solano County is actually doing a little bit better than the statewide average, and Contra Costa County is below the statewide average. Um, and also there's an economic um, economic benefit to CalFresh benefits when it's estimated that for every dollar in CalFresh benefits, it produces $1.79 in economic activity. So it's estimated that $147 million in economic activity is missing from Contra Costa County because of those missing benefits and $43 million to Solano counties. Are there any ideas as to why Contra Costa has a lower number of CalFresh recipients? Is that something we'll be addressing? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there are a number of different reasons. Um, partly just because of, there's a lot of stigma about CalFresh benefits in the community, um, especially a, among undocumented populations. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about applying for CalFresh and how it will affect immigration status or that it will have to be paid.
take back. Um, and so that's part of the work that I'll touch on later uh, that the, um, in partnership with different folks that are here, the, Cal the food bank is working on on a daily basis to try to increase enrollment in that program. Oh, can I say something? Yeah. I think also because we get a lot of homeless and it, it, they come from Oakland, they come from San Francisco, <coughs> and they're moving east, they're moving into our county. And I think one of the things that Lisa will touch on when she speaks is also um, SSI recipients are not eligible for CalFresh, so that's another barrier that we see um, in our area. Those numbers, <coughs> those numbers have gotten better over the last five years. The percentage has gone up. It's, it's also really difficult because estimates are based on, um, it's really hard to estimate the potentially eligible population. Right, because estimates of poverty and who is on SSI um, are generally delayed because most of those numbers come from the census. So the most recent data we had was 2014. And for that reason, it's really difficult for us to assess improvements and where we are in this moment in time. So we kind of struggle with the data on a regular basis. And because the need has been growing too, um, so the percentages might not change, but we're serving more people because there's more people in need as well. Mm -hmm. I was just curious about the, um, so the, the, who qualifies, right, is obviously based on some dollar amount. Has that also been in flux? Um, Laura, do you recognize that it's a greater need or has it made, have they raised the bar in other words or lowered it? It, it fluctuates every year, so every year the federal government <coughs> updates the eligibility, um, the income eligibility guidelines for CalFresh. Over the past few years, it has not changed greatly. It's gone up by maybe five dollars here, ten dollars there. The inflation rate's been pretty. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so thank you, Lisa. Um, now we're going to. Hear from a different Lisa, um, <laughs> who has been one of the food bank's strongest advocates. Um, Lisa, I will, I will let Lisa share her story in her own words, but um, as a little bit of background, Lisa receives SSI and lives in Bay Point and has come up, I'm not even sure that I can count the number of times anymore, to Sacramento to meet with our state elected officials, um, to testify before hearings. Uh, I remember one hearing where Lisa spoke um, about receiving SSI and the need to increase those benefits, make SSI recipients eligible for CalFresh. She shared her story, um, and Senator Holly Mitchell from Southern California was the chair of that budget committee. Um, and what, six months later, we were in the Capitol again and saw Holly Mitchell, and she remembered Lisa. <laughs> she remembered her story and quoted it back to her. So Lisa is a very powerful speaker um, and a very powerful advocate, and we're really happy to have you on our team. Um, so you can either stay stay seated if, unless you want to come up um, and speak a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'm going to, uh, I don't speak fast, so please forgive me. But yes, I am an SSI recipient and um, well, I don't qualify for food stamps or CalFresh or whatever they want to call it because I get SSI. Well, you know, it doesn't cut it. It doesn't help. Um, I gotta pay bills first. I can't even pay my medication. I can't afford it. I either have to have clean clothes or have a little bit of food or pay a bill. But I can't go buy food and I can't go to all the food banks that I'm eligible for because I don't have a car. I do the best I can with what I've got. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes, yeah, I get emotional. Um, I just don't understand how people can say we're surviving, we're not. We can't, we're not even scraping the bottom of the barrel because there's nothing there to scrape. I see kids in my neighborhood hungry, terribly hungry. Asking for food. I'm used to a child asking for food. Me, fine, take my food, but why are you gonna take it from other people and families? I don't understand how we're supposed to love our country, but we're not helping it. 
five dollars an extra a month from Social Security, yay, I get to do laundry. And that's sad when you're that excited about five dollars. Or you can get a package of hamburger. And even though I don't have that much money, I'll still feed the kids. And I'll feed the homeless and I'll help them. I'll go without. But it's gotta stop. We've gotta help the people here. We've gotta help the kids. You want them to do right, help them. Be there for them, listen to them. You know, um, a lot of people can't get to food banks because I, I don't have a car, so I can't, therefore, that's it. You can't. It's not supposed to be this way. We need to help each other. We need to get a raise. We need to show these people, why can't we put somebody in an apartment in Bay Point, give them the minimal and no food stamps, and we'll see how long they can survive not going to be very long before they go crazy because they got to worry about everything. I don't sleep at night when it comes to the end of the month because I've got to sit there and put out whatever I can to make sure nothing gets shut off and then I do without my medication. I'm diabetic. I have to do without and that's what these other people are doing. They're doing without because they can't get to the food. They can't get the assistance from SSI. A cost of living raise, has anybody gone shopping? We weren't allowed to have one for how long? Because they said nothing went up. I don't know where they shop, but everywhere where I go, that stuff's through the roof. It's ridiculous. A gallon of milk you can't even afford anymore. And that's why I just want to help. I want to see us succeed. I don't want us to turn into a country where we have to stand in line everywhere and, and pray to God that when we get to the end of that line, we get something or, we're be, or we can be helped. A lot of times those lines get closed and they're like, sorry. And they go home to their comfortable <coughs> home and we go home to ours and nothing gets taken care of. That's why we should act and start and help regardless of what everybody does without because there's a lot more people doing worse off than any of us. So I hope what I said helped and please forgive the tears. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. and your experience uh, has, has touched so many people and it takes an unbelievable amount of strength to get up in front of a crowd of people and share those personal things about your life. Um, but we really, really appreciate you coming here this morning. And, and I think that, you know, hearing that the SSI program exists, that benefit levels are 90% of the federal poverty line for individuals in California, I think those numbers are, are difficult to wrap your mind around. And so we really appreciate you um, speaking to the choices that you have to make um, and what it is to really live it at that level. Um, so thank you so much for, for coming and speaking. Um, so to, to follow up with that, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the advocacy work that the food bank has been doing um, and what our priorities have been uh, at the federal level. Last year, most of our efforts focused on child nutrition reauthorization, uh, which is a, a package of bills that come around every five years um, and they govern school breakfast, school lunch, summer meals, the WIC program, which are nutritional benefits for women, infants, and children. Um, and so we did a lot of advocacy around trying to ensure that the new bill that was reauthorized made improvements to those programs. Um, and ultimately there was no action taken on child and nutrition reauthorization. There were a number of different um, proposals from, from the House and the Senate um, and nothing was ultimately voted on or passed. So those programs will just continue um, as they are and be extended uh, until 
Congress decides to reauthorize them. And, and ultimately, I think that we were happier with the, the continuation of the status quo than some of the proposed changes and cuts and block grants um, that were being considered by Congress. So although it is not uh, a, a win in terms of what we were hoping to see from the uh, Child Nutrition Reauthorization Bill, um, you know, continuing things as they are was better than the alternatives that we were looking at. And that may unfortunately be a theme with some of the federal advocacy that we are, are looking at moving forward. But, um, yeah, question. So if we need the House or the Senate, so who, who are your champions for, for, for this type of advocacy? For the child nutrition reauthorization in our district, you mean? In no, 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 no. I mean, is, is there a particular senator or representative, regardless of where they're from, that really is, you know, carries the torch on this kind of thing? I don't want to assume that it's just the Democrat, you know, the, just the Democratic Party that does it, or just, I'd like to know if there is actually someone, so in other words, if I, as a volunteer or an advocate for the food bank, want to pick up the phone if something's going on, like who, I, I get that I can call, um, Mr. Sommier's office or Cole's, uh, or uh, Feinstein <coughs> or Harris. I'm saying though, is there somebody in the Senate that's a, a friend of this type of program? Is there somebody who's got it on you know, one of their... Yeah, certainly. There are a number um, of strong champions in both the House and the Senate among <coughs> Republicans and Democrats um, for child nutrition programs. Um, there's certainly a number of names that I can follow up with you uh, about that, but generally if you want to reach out to your elected officials to, you know, give your support as a citizen, um, I'd encourage you to reach out to your elected officials first since they are, you know, it is their job to represent you. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about who the champions in the House and the Senate are, I can definitely get that yeah. information to you. Great. Um, yeah. yeah what, sure. I used to do Carly. Probably about for decades before I retired. And I can tell you um, that generally, if you're not their constituent, they'll be very polite to you, but they could care less if you're calling them if they're a congressman from Iowa or a senator from pick your favorite state. It's a, so frankly, you're much better off spending your time with your local elected where you can actually make a difference versus the other advocacy, which you really can't do. Yeah, yeah, so <coughs> if you can talk to the staff about the that's not my point. My point is like, if, if, if I find out that Marcus Sonia is not on that list, that's something you said I can call and say, I know who my friends and say, hey, you know what, there's a bill out there and you know your colleague from uh, you know, Colorado has got this on his or her plate. Can you know, can I can you partner with them? Right? Yeah. I, I, I know the, the I know the the um, the efficacy of contacting the person who represents you. I get that. But I'd like to know who's out there as our champion mm. now in this district. Because these are pretty volatile times, right? So it'd be good to know. Can I, can I jump in real quick? <coughs> Long term from uh, Senator Dobbs' office. And I don't want to step on the toes of my counterparts here, but <clears throat> I know that Senator Dobbs um, is a, an advocate of, of this program. Um, as, and I know personally, I mean very, very personally, that uh, uh, Congressman Sane, uh, I talked to him last night, um, is an advocate of this program. And I know that Supervisor Anderson is, has this. <clears throat> very, this issue is very dear to their hearts, and so it's not like we're not trying. Um, guys like myself, um, who spent 37 years in police work, seeing both sides of this, um, I have the senator there. When he gets in the car, he's trapped with me. You know, he's got his, <laughs> he can't jump out. And so I know that we're just faced with a lot of difficult times right now from the state level, the federal level, and the county level, and so it's going to be a battle. And the only way that we're going to be able to win this battle is support from organizations like this, um, and keep bringing this issue up. Uh, we're losing on a lot of fronts, and and we're actually anticipating. <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing a little bit more uh, with this new Trump administration. Um, right now, with the governor's budget. Um, we're just looking at a $1.6 billion shortfall, which is what, 3.1% of the, of, the, of the budget. And so uh, things are gonna get a little bit tougher than they are going to get easier. But I, I can assure you that all of your elected officials that you have in Swanton County, Contractor County, locally, 
Or Toronto. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you my card. And if you have any other questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you for providing that context. And we do have really supportive elected officials at county, state, federal levels, and, and we're very lucky to have um, such supportive elected officials. So again, thank you to everyone in the room who is or is representing elected officials, because we know that we have um, a lot of strong champions in our corner. Um, another one of our federal priorities is the TFAP program, um, which stands for Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program, and those are the USDA commodities that we distribute. Um, they come in the form of cans and dry goods, um, and they also provide administrative costs to help with transportation and storage. Um, and so we work to ensure that those funds were allocated um, and that their additional extra funds were used for bonus purchases. Um, and so we got a lot of support um, and letters in from, from our elected officials on that. Um, and then our priority over the past year and in the future is always to protect and, and strengthen the SNAP program, um, which we will cow fresh at the, the state level and food stamps. Um, I know it gets very confusing with all of the different names for the same programs. Um, but that is going to be another one of our top priorities moving forward. Um, there have been numerous attempts to try and cut the SNAP program, to block grant it. Um, even from you know current leaders in Congress, and so we, uh, if there are any proposals that surface to reduce benefits or to block grant the program, um, those are things that we will staunchly oppose. Um, as we can see from the fact that a third of all CalFresh recipients in California also rely on food banks to be able to make it through the end of the month, you know it's our perspective and understanding that the benefit levels are not adequate as they are right now. We don't need cuts. We need uh, an increase in those benefits. Um, and we really need to focus on maximizing <coughs> participation in the program and, and making sure that everybody who's eligible is able to take advantage of the program. And so res further restrictions and el eligibility um, or changing the structure of the program from an entitlement program, which is how it is now. So anybody who qualifies for the program can sign up, enroll, and receive those benefits that freely flow from the federal government. If it's changed to a block grant structure, that just means that California is given a lump sum um, to allocate as it sees fit to everyone who qualifies for the program. But in a time of recession, when numbers go up dramatically, states uh, would then be faced with the choice to reduce benefits for everyone, create a waiting list, um, and, and it destroys one of the most important um, aspects of this program, which is its flexibility and that it can quickly and immediately expand during times of crisis and then contract as the economy recovers. So um, protecting the, the structure uh, and integrity of the SNAP program and making improvements to it uh, where there is the opportunity to do so uh, is one of our top priorities at the federal level. We are hoping that the farm bill will be uh, a vehicle to make changes to that program. Um, and continuing forward, we will also support the TFAP program um, and work so that we get the same USDA commodities um, and increases and expansions where possible there as well. Um, are there any questions about the federal advocacy? Then I will move on to state. Um, so we had uh, considerably more wins at the state level last year than, than we did at the federal level. Um, for the first time ever, $2 million was allocated in the state budget for food banks through the Cal Food program. So um, all of the food banks in California get an, an allocation of that $2 million based off of the population that they serve. Um, and we can use those funds to purchase California grown uh, foods. So our food bank has been using that money to buy more produce, um, to distribute more fresh fruits and vegetables throughout the community. Other food banks have been buying eggs, milk, meats, and things like that. And so having that um, source of funding from the state government has been extremely helpful for us. I think many people don't realize that food banks are not actually government entities. Um, and that the majority of our budget comes from personal donations. Um, and so we actually have not been receiving much financial support from the state. So this was a really exciting investment on the state's part. Um, and $2 million is you know, significant to us, but not a huge piece of the state budget. 
And so we're hoping um, to increase our ask this year, but for every dollar that the state invests in our food bank network, we're able to provide uh, five meals on average for the state. So it's a very efficient use um, of state funds. And they're also, um, to support food banks, was an extension, an expansion of uh, tax credit for agricultural donors who donate uh, extra produce to food banks like ours uh, to help sort of cover the costs of harvesting, packaging, and transporting those goods to organizations that can then distribute it to the community. There also is um, the Market Match program where if you take your CalFresh EBT card and go to a farmer's market, you can pull $10 off your account and they'll give you $20 worth of tokens to spend on fresh fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market. So it really makes uh, people's food assistance benefits go much farther. It supports local farmers. Um, it's been a really, really successful program and the state of California invested $5 million in that, which will be matched by 5 million from the federal government um, and will allow us to expand this really successful program. So we're excited about do, that. Do um, all of the Contra Costa farmer's market in partnership with that program? So we actually, the food bank publishes um, a little map and a list of all of the farmer's markets, which ones accept EBT and which ones accept market match. The vast majority accept both. Um, but if you're interested after, I can mm -hmm. hand out those flyers to anyone who's interested so you can see where, where sure. folks can take advantage of this program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that um, one of the really great things about the funding for the market match, um, when we talk to clients, Interview clients are um, are giving away the produce on the many sites that we that we service. Um, we find out that you know, think of your teenage kid, right? Um, how how much fun they had eating their fruits and vegetables, right? And what a struggle it was. So for for people that are food insecure or rely on food giveaways or programs like this, you literally can't afford to have your child not eat something. So if you know they're going to eat, you know for lack of a better way to say it, junk food, and that's their preference versus, say, um, an apple or an orange. Junk food means that they're gonna get calories, right? And you need to feed them. So you, you can't afford to buy an apple or an orange and see that go bad and risk that your child won't eat it. So the nice thing about the, the, the matching at the farmer's markets, among other programs, is that you can they can literally afford to have their kids try something and get them used to it, and it's literally, quote, unquote, no cost or less cost that particular person. So that's why these things are just really great. And when we talk to the clients, we find out how few actually know about it. So that's something that, you know, we really have to, you know, we want to do a better job. I don't want to say that, but it'd be great if we could figure out ways of communicating with clients so that they know they can go to farmers markets and and they're not as pricey as people think. And not only that, but they can get even more bang for their job. So it's a great program. So a couple of other uh, successes that we had at the state level um, is was a very modest but significant, um, you know, demonstrably significant oh, yeah, increase uh, cost of living adjustment for SSI recipients. So as Lisa mentioned, SSI is called the Supplemental Security Income Program, um, and they're grants uh, for individuals who are disabled or uh, seniors who aren't able to work anymore, and so. The maximum grant is now just a little over $900 a month for individuals, um, and so the increase that Lisa was referring to of $5 a month um, came out of the cost of living adjustment um, invested from the state. There also uh, was a Breakfast After the Bell grants, which are funds to allow schools to um, start and expand Breakfast After the Bell programs, which really increased participation uh, in those programs. Uh, by making it more convenient for students to participate. And then our priorities moving forward are continued and increased funding for, for that Cal Foods program, uh, which I mentioned, to continue to work on SSI to make sure that we have further cost of living adjustments, uh, increases to the grant eligibility for CalFresh. Um, there's a lot of facets that we're working on uh, in respect to SSI program. There also, um, our local Senator Nancy Skinner has introduced a bill that would allow um, individuals to start their applications for CalFresh and SSI uh, prior to their release from incarceration to really support that reentry process. Um, there also is a bill that would expand access to uh, school meals for low-income schools um, and students. 
uh, that was introduced by Senator McGuire. There also <coughs> is um, a bill that will continue the tax checkoff that exists for um, food banks. And there are a number of other bills um, that have not yet been introduced and numbered, but are coming down the pipeline. And so uh, we can send out our legislative agenda once it is finalized and we know all of the anti-hunger bills at the state level, but that's a little sneak preview of some of the issues that we'll be working on, but uh, we look forward to more anti-hunger bills being introduced and updating you all when that happens. Um, and so now Caitlin is going to speak about some of the advocacy and outreach that we've done at the local county level. Yeah, so as Carly mentioned, we do a lot of work on the federal and state level to try to protect programs like CalFresh. Um, but on a local level, what we engage in is more administrative advocacy to try to ensure that those programs are implemented to their full potential and are also accessible to the people we serve. As Lisa mentioned, the low participation rates with the CalFresh program are something that we're really concerned about. Those are more people that are coming to get food from us because they don't have access to those programs. And so we're really looking at ways that we can increase participation um, in both Contra Costa and Solano counties. So one of the ways that the food bank has done that is we have a team of five dedicated staff members that sole job is to go out to our food distributions and help folks figure out while they're in line to receive food, if they might be eligible for CalFresh benefits. And if they are to help them fill out the application to um, navigate the process, which can be complicated at times, and advocate on their behalf if necessary as they go through that process. One exciting innovation that we've been able to utilize is uh, an app called Get CalFresh, which is basically a shortened version of the CalFresh application. It allows people to apply in five to 10 minutes. It can be done on an iPad. So our staff goes out with iPads and helps folks apply that way. Really great for a distribution line where people are in and out and wanting to have kids in tow and wanting to get out, um, you know, get on to the next errand that they have. And that also enables us to take pictures of any documentation that they have and submit those documents with the application, ensuring a more complete application, hopefully getting them through the process a little bit quicker in that way. We've also worked with both Contra Costa County and Solano County staff to um, strengthen language in their, their county legislative platforms to protect emergency food providers, support emergency food providers, and protect and strengthen um, the CalFresh program. Um, a unique opportunity that we've had in Contra Costa County is the CalFresh partnership group, many of whom are sitting right here. Um, which is a unique partnership between Contra Costa County Employment and Human Services staff and local community-based organizations. So First Five, the Family Economic Security Partnership, Multi-Faith Action Coalition, Ensuring Opportunity, all partners that are really um, tasked with wanting to increase participation and figuring out how we can do that both from the county administrative side to reduce barriers and from an outreach side to just get more people enrolled. Um, some of the great things that have come out through that partnership has been a, what we call a CalFresh Express event, where county eligibility workers come out to a community center, the food bank brings our produce truck, the UC Cooperative Extension does food tastings, and people that bring their documents are able to apply for, have their interview with the eligibility worker and be approved for benefits all in one day. Is it a non-starter to try to get to the point where um, folks can get CalFresh and SSI? No, it's not a non-starter. I think it's definitely something that we're interested in. I mean, it's there are some um, complications to doing that, but it's definitely, as Lisa mentioned, I mean, the fact that you're living on $900 a month at the maximum and not able to be eligible for the CalFresh program is just wrong. So I think it's something that, you know, we definitely want to work towards. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with the CalFresh Express event, the great thing about that is you basically reduce what is generally a two to three week long process into a matter of hours. So it really helps 
all clients, but especially more vulnerable populations that might not have transportation or are homeless and getting to and from a county office really isn't an option. We also, over the last year, in partnership with Contra Costa County and our local school districts, did a direct mail campaign to Medi-Cal with support from the John Muir Community Health Foundation, Health Fund, um, <coughs> did a direct mail campaign to folks that are on Medi-Cal and not currently receiving CalFresh and to families that whose children are receiving free or reduced lunch but aren't necessarily receiving CalFresh. And through that direct mail campaign, we were able to help over 900 families uh, fill out CalFresh applications. So that was a really great win. Um, another thing that we've been able to do in partnership with Pittsburgh Unified School District is pilot implementation of Assembly Bill 402. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, that is a bill that allows local school districts to share the information of families who are on free reduced lunch with the county CalFresh office so that those families can seamlessly get enrolled in CalFresh. Um, and so Pittsburgh Unified, one of our best partners in the county, was willing to take that on um, and piloted that last year and we hope to continue that going forward and expand it. Also a quick shout out about AB402, that was also introduced by Nancy Skinner when she was in the assembly. So. Um, so what's coming up for the next year? Well, one thing that we hope to continue is to promote um, summer meal sites. Summer, The summer meal program is a really great program. We're lucky in both of our, in Contra Costa and Solano counties, we have great school districts with very strong summer meal programs. But we find that a lot of the clients that we serve just don't know about them. So we hope to continue to pass out flyers at our food bank distributions, as well as put the information up on our website to really get the word out that your child doesn't have to miss out on meals just because school's out. Um, so strengthening that program is really important to us moving forward. Um, our CalFresh staff will continue to strengthen partnerships and not only go out to our food distributions, but go out to local community-based organizations such as Spark Point, um, the Family Justice Center, and others where WIC offices is a huge one where we can help people sign up for CalFresh. Um, another new population that they are working to target over the next year is um, college students. I'm sure <coughs> many of you have read the local <coughs> latest news about the prevalence of food insecurity on college campuses from UC to CSU to community colleges. And that's something that we, we are really um, committed to fighting hunger among college students. You, you can't study and pay for housing and pay for books and all of those other things if you don't have enough money for food. So our CalFresh staff has created partnerships um, with some of the local community colleges and even the CSU Concord campus to try to um, get more, more students enrolled in CalFresh. We hope to strengthen, um, to better coincide our legislative platform with both counties' legislative platform to better strengthen the language around uh, protecting and strengthening CalFresh and to align those legislative platforms so that our collective voice is heightened and, and better heard throughout the community. Um, we are also working uh, in Contra Costa County with CalFresh on reducing churn and I, churn is kind of a, uh, I'll <coughs> define it for you. Um, basically every six months a family has to fill out a semi-annual report in order to stay on the CalFresh program. And that is a point at which many families fall off the program. Um, just not because they're not eligible anymore, but just because they're, for whatever reason, don't fill out that paperwork. So what we're doing at the food bank is working with the county to send a postcard to families right as their benefits are about to be expired to tell them to call us if they need help, if they want us to resend um, their semi-annual report, if they want help filling it out, to try to get more people to stay on the program once they're on. It's estimated in Contra Costa County that 30% of new applications are people that just fell off within the past month. So we're hoping that by reducing that, we can not only help the client because their benefits are continuous and there isn't a stoppage, 
but also <coughs> to help the overworked county staff that's seeing the same people come in every six months. It just, it doesn't make sense. Is, it, is that is the semi-annual report a federal requirement or a state requirement? It's a federal requirement. Yeah, we used to California used to be on quarterly reporting. Oh God! So, which was a state option. Um, so we've gotten better, believe it or not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's a federal requirement every six months. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that we're hoping to do over the next year is expand the implementation of AB 402 across Contra Costa County, try to get more school districts, especially school districts that have high um, populations of free or reduced lunch, um, to try to get them to adopt implementing that and better align um, the, the free or reduced lunch summer, uh, the school meal program with CalFresh. So ultimately, as Carly mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen on the federal and state level, but what we do know is that in our local community, we have a great group of committed community-based partners and elected officials that we will be working with to try to protect hunger in Contra Costa, or fight hunger in Contra Costa and Solano mm -hmm. County. touched upon before, um, the food bank's mission statement is to lead the fight to end hunger in partnership with our community and in service of our neighbors in need. Um, and our advocacy program, um, as having a full-time advocacy manager, is, is relatively new. I've only been around for just over a year. Um, but the food bank um, sees advocacy as, as a really important component of actually achieving our mission statement. Um, and as Larry mentioned, We've been distributing food throughout the community for 40 years and the need still exists. And so we are hoping that in addition to providing for the immediate needs of, of families in our community, that we can also do a little bit more and think a little bit bigger to try and reduce the number of folks that need to come to us in the first place and to ensure that when people do experience tough times, that they're able to be immediately connected to resources that they need in a dignified way so that nobody ever has to experience hunger in our community. Um, and so we have uh, a little bit of time for, for questions and a quick discussion if anyone, um, yeah, has anything that they would like to, to touch upon or share. Yeah. What, what are some of the biggest barriers you have to getting the word out? I mean, I know passing up flyers is one, but in terms of maybe like maybe working with contacts to get some, uh, you know, other non other nonprofits to get uh, free advertising to them or anything to the outlets. What, or maybe even through our offices, and we could help broker some relationships, or even have a, a town hall or even a, a round table and inviting the press to help get the word out. I mean, I, I, I could totally see something like that happening. But what are some of the, what are your barriers for the food making to getting the word out? Yeah. Do, do you want to speak to that? Sure. <laughs> um, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, you know what? I think that we um, we try to work with. <laughs> Um, you know, Comcast and other media outlets, um, I think it's just, you know, we, we have budget constraints as well, and um, I, I think we make an effort to get the word out. Um, I don't know if Larry, if you want to. Well, and we have gotten some funding from the Comcast Long Foundation, and we actually are running commercials. We actually have got money to produce commercials and buy time, and they are more working at trying to let people know that you're not a bad person And those are those commercials are up on our YouTube channel, um, so you can see them. They're really looking at changing the perception of CalFresh in our community. Can I go out there? This is me who doesn't know know uh, technology very well at all. But if you do any kind of podcast stuff, there is a thing called On the Media, and they have done a show called Busted, <coughs> a five part show, basically talking about you know why poverty exists in this country, and it is amazing. It really is. I mean, it makes you ashamed of who we are in a lot of ways. It's just the stigma we put on.